We would ask um, the commission to please come up uh, right now. Uh, the Honorable Allison McFarlane, the Honorable Christine Svinicki, the Honorable William Ostendorf, the Honorable Jeff Barron, the Honorable Stephen Burns. Chair McFarlane, we're going to start with you, and you get to have five minutes. The other commissioners get to have two minutes, if they wish, and welcome. Very Good morning. Good. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, distinguished members of the committee. Good to see you this morning. My colleagues and I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you on behalf of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. As you know, this is likely the last time I will appear before you in my capacity as chairman of the NRC. Therefore, let me share with you some of the accomplishments we have made over the past two and a half years. The NRC continues to make significant progress in implementing post-Fukushima safety enhancements. We've seen the first reactors come into compliance with the mitigating strategies and spent fuel pool instrumentation orders. Licensees have purchased backup diesel generators, pumps, piping, cabling, and other equipment, and they've strategically placed it around their sites. Some have built earthquake-proof structures to ensure that this equipment is protected from natural disasters. They've standardized connections on the components so that backup equipment can be quickly and easily connected. Other licensees are preparing to make safety system modifications so they can complete their enhancements on time as required during their spring refueling outages. As a result of these activities, nuclear power plants in the United States will have more defense in depth to cope with the prolonged loss of off-site power and other severe accident conditions. The NRC continues to work closely with licensees to monitor and inspect their progress. In addition, the industry's two national response centers in Memphis and Phoenix are now operational. While the work is not done, the progress we've made is substantial and impressive. I believe it's essential that both the NRC and the industry keep this sustained focus until all of the near-term task force recommendations are addressed. The NRC continues its oversight of new reactor construction at Watts Bar Unit 2, Plant Vogel, and VC Summer. While we've had to address quality control challenges with construction suppliers, we're satisfied with the overall work that's underway. Licensees have an essential role in vendor oversight and construction quality, and this responsibility must remain paramount for any new reactor construction. We expect to issue a decision on the operating license for the Watts Bar 2 plant in mid-2015. We've renewed our focus at the NRC on the back end of the fuel cycle, in part as a result of a number of recent reactor shutdowns. Licensees have requested certain license amendments and exemptions from NRC regulations to reflect changes that will occur when fuel is permanently removed from the units. For instance, the NRC has granted Wisconsin's Kewanee Power Station exemptions from specific emergency planning requirements, but we denied a separate exemption request related to certain physical security regulations that we believed were important to keep in place. Now that multiple reactors are decommissioning, I believe it's time for the NRC to examine whether specific regulations for decommissioning should be developed. In August 2014, after a two-year rulemaking process that included extensive public engagement, the Commission approved the NRC's final continued storage rule and generic environmental impact statement. The implementation of the rule in October enables the NRC to complete several licensing actions that have been suspended pending the outcome of this rulemaking. The NRC will continue to ensure that spent fuel is stored safely and securely at reactor sites but I firmly believe that this should not be a reason to slow or stop progress on a permanent disposal solution for the United States. During my tenure, the NRC has also taken steps to enhance its public engagement, including improving our public meeting process. I'm proud of the progress we've made in this area, and I believe public engagement is equally important for industry. Maintaining effective relationships with the local community around a nuclear power plant builds trust, and facilitates open, effective discussions and decision-making. 
We've also emphasized engagement at the interagency and international levels, recognizing that the NRC is best positioned to ensure safety and security when the interagency understands and supports our important mission. Internationally, we've worked to further our cooperation and assistance to enhance global nuclear safety and security. The NRC continues to be prudent in expending agency resources and is working to improve the transparency of our fees. We're engaged, we've engaged an independent firm to study and provide recommendations on fee allocation methods. We plan to hold a public meeting in early 2015 to address generic issues raised in public comments on the fee rule for FY 2014. The Commission has also directed the NRC staff to take a hard look at how we can effectively, efficiently, and flexibly meet our safety and security mission under any future circumstances. The staff is currently working both internally and externally to analyze where the nuclear industry will be over the next five years and anticipate commensurate changes to the NRC skill sets and resources. It's been an honor to lead the agency during the past two and a half years. I've learned much during my tenure, and I leave satisfied that the good work of the agency will continue well into the future. I'm grateful to the agency's talented, dedicated staff for their tireless efforts to support our important mission and to my colleagues for their support and for our collaboration. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy now to answer your questions. Thank you. We'll turn to uh, Commissioner Svinnick. Thank you, Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, and members of the committee. In the interest of the Senate's uh, voting schedule, may I request just to submit my of brief course. statement for the record? Thank you. Without objection. Now we'll turn to Commissioner Austin Dorff. Thank you. Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, and members of the committee. Regarding lessons learned from Fukushima, the NRC and industry have made significant progress on these activities that we determined must be accomplished without haste. Those are the tier one activities that are most safety significant. Several licensees, as noted by the chairman, have already complied with the mitigating strategies order. These modifications will be subject to NRC inspection to ensure appropriate implementation and followed by codification in a rulemaking. As I reflect on the work that has been completed by the agency and industry and on the activities that still remain, I am proud of the agency's reliance on solid principles of science, engineering, and risk management. I appreciate this committee's oversight role, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We turn to now Commissioner Barron. Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today before the Environment and Public Works Committee. Since I started on the commission in October, it has been a privilege to work with my fellow commissioners. Together, we bring a diversity of experience and perspectives to our deliberations. On a personal note, I want to publicly say that I deeply appreciate the warm welcome they have given me. I believe we are all working very well together and building productive collegial relationships. It has been a busy time at the Commission. We have held Commission meetings on a number of topics, including Watts Bar 2 unit licensing, small modular reactors, NRC's international activities, and Project AIM 2020, which is NRC's effort to appropriately match resources to workload and increase the agility and efficiency of the agency. I've also met with a broad range of stakeholders, including the Nuclear Energy Institute, American Nuclear Society, NRDC, and Union of Concerned Scientists. I had the opportunity to meet the senior leadership of many of NRC's licensees at the annual IMPO CEOs conference. I also recently visited Watts Bar Units 1 and 2 and look forward to touring additional NRC regulated facilities in the near future. I remain committed to bringing an open minded and thoughtful approach to the policy and adjudicatory issues pending before the Commission, such as decommissioning plant licensing exemptions staff guidance for the use of qualitative factors and cost-benefit analysis, updates to the force-on-force -force inspection program, and the examination of NRC's foreign ownership and control standards. These are complex issues, but I am confident that the Commission has the positive working relationships and wide range of experience needed to successfully address them. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Commissioner Burns. Thank you, Chairman Boxer, Ranking Member Vitter, and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to appear before you today. As many of you know, I first started at the NRC as a junior attorney back in the 19, late 1970s, and I would not have imagined I'd be sitting before you today as, as a commissioner. But the mission of the agency remains as vitally important today as it was then. 
the protection of public health and safety and the common defense and security against the potential hazards posed by radiological materials is a critically important task and one to which I have committed my entire career. The NRC also has a responsibility to ensure that its decisions are based on sound legal and technical footing and are transparent to all stakeholders. Over the past few years, I've spent uh, outside the NRC and the international community, and that has allowed me to take stock of the agency. And I continue to believe it's a, uh, one of the finest organizations in our, in our government. And I can say from the perspective of the international community that the NRC is enormously respected and is often looked to for technical and policy leadership. However, acknowledging the, the agency's high caliber should not be understood to mean that we cannot improve. We all recognize that the climate in which the agency operates has changed over the last number of years, and it's our obligation to be agile in responding to changes in that environment. In closing, I thank the committee for their continued support of the NRC and the opportunity to appear here today. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. McFarland, thank you for your service. I so appreciate um, you serving the people of this country in the very important position that you're in. I wish you well in the future. In August of 2014, the NRC staff paper acknowledges, and I quote, NRC guidance directs the NRC staff to quantify benefits and costs of a proposed regulatory action to the extent possible, close quote. Would you agree that whenever it can be done that the NRC staff should focus on that quantitative factor in, in reaching decisions? Uh, the NRC does focus on the quantitative factors in reaching many of these decisions. But nonetheless, there are often qualitative factors that are also important in considerations. And I think uh, some of the quantitative factors that are considered are they themselves not necessarily fully quantitative, like the price of the cost of a, a, a human life. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Markey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, experts agree that the Fukushima meltdowns could have been prevented if the reactors had been protected against the tsunami threats that they were known to face. The 2011 Fukushima near-term task force report recommended that reactor operators use modern science to predict the amount of flooding that might occur at each reactor and then upgrade safety equipment to prevent such a flood from causing damage. Now, I've received documents that have not been publicly released yet that I request be made a part of the record that say that NRC staff agreed with a Nuclear Energy Institute request to eliminate this key Fukushima task force recommendation. The NRC staff recommended that NRC no longer require reactor upgrades to prevent flooding, but only an increased ability to respond to potential floods. And that is a lot like your doctor telling you not to get a flu shot because he can just treat you once you get the flu expecting you not to uh, point out that thousands of Americans die of the flu each year. Fifteen senior NRC employees, including one who was actually an author of the Fukushima Task Force report, have filed formal disagreements with the NRC staff paper. One of these documents said that even though the proposal would save the industry money, it would gut this post-Fukushima safety recommendation. So my first question is, do any of you disagree that requiring both flood protection and flooding response measures would provide a higher level of safety than flooding response measures only? Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator. This issue has just become come before the Commission, and so I doubt that any of my colleagues, I certainly haven't had time to digest it, to look at this issue in detail, right, well, let, let so me, I would request that we take this one for the record. Well, why don't I let the others mention it? I asked a general question, and I will go with you first, uh, Commissioner Barron. I haven't had a chance to review the paper yet, but I agree with your, your general point, that it's important to both prevent a problem and have an ability to respond to it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner. 
Senator Markey, the uh, question you've posed is the core disagreement between the technical experts who differ and the staff recommendation that the Commission officially received. I'm still exploring to understand the, the points of departure between the two viewpoints. Well, again, do any of you disagree that prevention and response is better than just response? Could keep Commissioner. Senator Markey, I appreciate the question. Uh, as the Chairman noted this before the Commission, I'll just tell you that uh, on Friday of this week, Commissioner Burns and I are meeting with non-concurring staff to better understand their viewpoints, and I know the rest of the Commission, when their schedules permit, will be doing the same to better understand where they're coming from in this. It's an important issue. Okay, Commissioner. At the, the basic principle, both prevention and mitigation is, 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 I think, fundamental in our regulatory system. As Commissioner Austin or says, we're going to be briefed on the paper and the, the sort of the robust exchange of views that we're having on it. Okay, and do any of you disagree that NRC staff should work together to resolve the disagreement by the 15 senior NRC employees before it submits the proposal to you for a vote? Do any of you disagree with that? Senator, we have at our agency uh, processes that allow our staff to formally disagree with senior management, which I think is actually one of the strengths of our agency, that we have put in place in, over the past few years these formal processes, the non-concurrence process and the differing professional opinions process. Okay, well, and right, this right now you have three senior man managers who are in disagreement, and I would just strongly recommend to you that you get that resolved before it comes up to the commission. When, when I, I'll tell you my practice, and I know this is true of Commissioner I, I have Austin one more question. Okay, I have just one more question I have to ask. I just give you that as my recommendation. I know you'll be gone, and again, I thank you for your service, but I think the commission has to resolve these issues. Last year, language I authored was enacted to require NRC to provide non-public documents to Congress after NRC attempted to change its policy in a way that would have automatically denied most congressional requests. But the agency is still refusing to comply with this law. For example, five members of the Chinese military were recently indicted on charges of hacking into U.S. companies' systems in 2010 and 2011 and stealing nuclear reactor trade secrets from Westinghouse. At the very same time that these thefts occurred, Westinghouse was hosting dozens of unescorted Chinese personnel at U.S. nuclear reactors for months. Now, you have refused to provide me with a meaningful response to my letters. Your staff even told mine that you would provide no additional information, even though other, staff, other members of your staff have told my staff that the FBI has no objection to your doing so. I have been made aware of many NRC meetings, letters, and presentations about this Chinese program. I have also learned that NRC's security staff recommended an increase in security requirements for the Chinese nationals, uh, uh, but others at NRC rejected the suggestion. Yet you provided none of these materials to me in violation of the law. The law requires NRC to provide non-public documents to Congress. Do each of you agree? to follow the law and to fully respond to any of my outstanding requests about this Chinese compromise uh, of the security uh, at nuclear facilities in the United States. Madam Chairman. Senator, with regard to this particular situation, we did learn about this program. Uh, <clears throat> we actually checked and ensured that the licensees were following our security regulations. We found that the licensees had granted limited access, and we verified that they, the licensees followed our requirements. Will In you provide instance, the non-public documents to me, to the committee, so that we can examine them? We will have to take that back, and I will talk about Again, that you're in violation office. of the law if you do not provide that information to the committee. We have a right to know what is the relationship between uh, Westinghouse and these Chinese uh, who are gaining access to nuclear facilities in the United States? Will you provide that information to the, to the committee and to my office? Senator, we did ensure that these folks followed our regulations, and we... Uh, That's not the question I'm asking you. The, the question is a yes or no, and could you do it because his time is running we're, out? We're happy on this particular Senator situation to provide you the information you need, we will provide you briefings on this topic. We are happy to do that. But no, you will not provide the documents. Is that what you're saying? 
we are happy to engage with you and engage with yeah, this committee. That is just unacceptable. Thank okay, I, I just think this point is unbelievable that we can't get a simple yes or no to a request for documents that we are entitled to that you swore that you would give to us when you were confirmed. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, let me ask this question to the uh, members of the uh, committee who will be continuing on um, because this is a forward-looking question. We have a massive carbon pollution problem in this world, and if anybody uh, needs a reference on that, look no further than today's AP CBS News story, Hotter, Weirder, How Climate Change Has Changed Earth. Nuclear power does not contribute to carbon pollution, and there are new technologies out there, um, some actually not so new, but they just haven't been deployed in the civilian electric power fleet. We have small modular reactors. Uh, the U.S. Navy has been running submarines and carriers off of that kind of reactor safely for decades, yet it has never transitioned into the electric fleet. Traveling Wave is a technology developed in the United States of America that has the potential, at least, to turn nuclear waste into electric power. Uh, the Chinese are now developing uh, traveling wave reactors. We are not. Thorium was developed as a reactor uh, back in the, I want to say, the 70s on an experimental basis in the United States. That initiative collapsed. The Chinese and the Indians are now building thorium reactors, again, a U.S.-based technology. And over and over again, what I hear is that an American industry that wants to go into these strategies and explore them has essentially a regulatory black box at the NRC. It has no idea when it walks into those woods how long the path will be, how winding it will be, what lurks there in the dark, and that the position of the NRC has been very reactive about this. You bring it to us and we'll take a look, as opposed to looking at this as a significant threat the carbon pollution problem as a grave problem, the nuclear solution as a potential solution. I'm not suggesting for a minute that anybody should step back on being completely safety-oriented, but I do think that a clearer way in the future of engaging with the industry to let them know what they have to look forward to. Because if you're planning to enter into this business on a business basis, huge question marks in the business plan are disabling. Even if the actual answer, if you could open the box, is that it's not that bad, um, because they simply can't take the risk to find out. You've got to be able to walk them through it in advance. I don't know why on earth the technology that drives our subs and our carriers has never been able to make it into the civilian fleet. I don't know why on earth the Chinese have to be developing thorium and traveling wave technologies. The, in the case of thorium, we've actually built and run in this country, but have never turned into a viable technology. And now to see the Chinese and the Indians out there doing it, again, uh, using our technology, it's very frustrating, particularly when you see this as an alternative to the coal fleet, which is doing such immense damage to our country and to our world. So um, if I could ask uh, Commissioners Barron, Svinicky, Ostendorf, and Burns to respond uh, briefly. Sure, thank you. Uh, Senator, I completely agree that it's NRC's responsibility to have an efficient and effective licensing process um, for small modular reactors and other reactor designs that um, may be coming in the future years. As um, Chairman McFarland mentioned, I, I think the, the earliest application we're likely to see for a small modular reactor is in 2016, the new scale uh, application. The Commission recently had, just last month, had a, a public meeting, but it's really like a hearing, um, with um, NRC staff and, and outside stakeholders to look at these very questions. And my impression is, and it, it seems pretty clear to me, that the NRC staff is focused on this, they're engaged on this, they're thinking through in advance what are the tough issues, technical issues, policy issues that have to be thought through in advance, whether it's control room staffing, whether it's security, emergency preparedness, annual fees, the range of issues where the answers might be different for a small modular reactor or an advanced design than for um, our traditional larger light water reactors. Um, that's happening. Information papers are being prepared. There may be some questions that come up to the Commission as policy matters, um, but my sense is the staff's been quite proactive on this. 
Commissioner Finicky. Senator, your, um, your reaction to the Indian and Chinese programs was similar to mine at the invitation of the U.S. State Department. I've had the opportunity to travel to both of those countries. Even knowing the level of activity in advance, it was hard not to be a bit overwhelmed at the level of activity and investment those countries are making in advanced reactors. What I would say is, is since my service on the commission in 2008, I've monitored the NRC activity in this area. I think it's been commensurate with the amount of industry interest in the United States. It's been scalable to that. Also, our extent of pre-application engagement where we meet with vendors in advance of them finalizing their design has really been somewhat unprecedented. We're trying, you said there's that regulatory uncertainty question mark. We're really working to try to fill that in so that we could get high quality applications. Thank you. Commissioner Ostendorf. Senator Whitehouse, thank you for the question. My background is in nuclear submarines. I spent 16 years on sea duty on six different submarines, driving reactors that were well, not too you, far sir. different from the size we're talking about here. Yep. Uh, so you can appreciate the question. Y yes, sir, absolutely. I I'd say that I've been in commission four and a half years. I've seen us, in the, even in the wake of Fukushima, go through the design certification approval for Westinghouse's AP-1000 design cert including licensing reactors to be built in, in South Carolina and in Georgia. I've seen this recently uh, approved GE Hitachi's Economic Simplified Boiling Water Reactor ESBWR design certification. Uh, along with Commissioner Svenicky and Commissioner Barron, I think we're ready for the SMR piece. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we can deal with this from a regulatory standpoint. Commissioner Burns, you have the last Yes, I, I agree with much of what my colleagues have saying. The, over the last couple of years, one of part of my duties at the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris was to provide support to the Generation 4 uh, Forum and Framework Agreement. And there's a lot of work being done there. And as Commissioner Svinicki said, I think part of it has been, in my experience, is, is that being able to, at least stepwise, being able to engage those who may be able, interested in the new technologies, that's what's important. Because, for example, on the generation for the small modular reactors that often are, are still of uh, the, the sort of current generation, uh, probably the process is a little clearer. But what we need to make sure we're adept and ready for is looking at the advanced technologies in terms of the frame, framework. Uh, we're, we're over my time. Sorry. The chairman is reminding I'm me. Sorry, Thank but you. I think it's so important to, to that question, and I appreciate it. Senator Gillibrand, just so we know, the vote is about to start, hasn't. Senator Gillibrand, you will ask your questions, and then I will stay and ask all of mine, and then the panel will be relieved to know they can go, and then the other panel will take a walk around the block, and we'll get back here as soon as we can, because I really want to talk about Diablo and hear from the people out there. So let's go to Senator Gillibrand. Thank you all for being here. I'm very grateful for your testimony and your participation. Um, I have three questions, and I'll t ask them all, and then you can, whoever wants to answer them can answer them. The first is um, emergency planning and an evacuation zone. Uh, we have Indian Point, as you know, uh, where 17 million people live within 50 miles of a uh, nuclear power plant. Now, you're familiar with the geography of New York. You know that in the event of an evacuation of New York City, the only options are north or west, which means you would have a large number of people evacuating towards Indian Point. Since uh, Fukushima, the FERC recommended that Americans within 50-mile radius be evacuated. So that sends a very mixed message for preparedness. So my question is, has the NRC taken any steps to work with FEMA and other government agencies to develop an emergency plan that encompasses the shadow evacuation zone? So that's my first area of inquiry. My second is about cybersecurity. Last year, the Department of Homeland Security and the Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team responded to well over 200 cyber-related incidents, with the majority taking place in the energy sector. This represents nearly a doubling of the recent yearly caseload. While these incidents have yet to cause a major disruption, the possibility of cyber-related terrorism is obviously a threat. The question I have is, how is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission working with utilities to address the growing threat? And are you seeing the same obstacles in the energy sector with regard to cyber incidents that other sectors are actually facing, whether the need for capital improvements, better information sharing in the industry with appropriate regulators and better training? Are those necessary? And then the third and final question is about seismic activity and seismic concerns, because if you, if you are aware, New York actually is on a fault line. 
So in November, NRC announced that it's requiring Indian Point to conduct a high-level earthquake risk report for both Units 2 and 3, a requirement for plants in the highest seismic risk category. This report must be completed by Jan June 2017. Do you think that more than two and a half years is an appropriate timeline to compete, complete this study for the plant with recent documented aging infrastructure and its proximity to 17 million people and the high risk? And once the risk evaluation is complete, when would you uh, suggest any actions to address be implemented? So three questions, and whoever thinks their most expertise on this, I'd appreciate a response. Let me... Let me uh Try to run through a couple of those. Let me take your last question first, your seismic uh, activity question. Uh, I think two and a half years is probably reasonable. There aren't a lot of seismic experts in the country. These uh, seismic performance assessments take a long time to do, and we want to make sure that they're done properly and thoroughly. Uh, in the interim, we have required plants that have qualified to do this extra analysis, this extra evaluation, to ensure that they have safety systems in place, and we are going to be inspecting them for that, okay? And they've given us their plans on that, and they will by the end of this year, and we will be inspecting them for that, okay? Um, and let me also say that with regards to Indian Point, we, ha we put them in our first priority category to move out on this, and they, were, they asked to be taken out of that first priority category. We refused. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, emergency planning, emergency preparedness, we do closely coordinate with FEMA on this. Mm -hmm. We do have extensive regulations. We are actually in the process of strengthening our regulations on emergency preparedness based on what happened in Fukushima. And uh, we do conduct regular drills and exercises have, with the state and local officials. Do you have a written plan that I can see? Because I just know the experience from Superstorm Sandy. If we yeah. had had to evacuate, we wouldn't have been able to because most of the roads in that region were closed because of downed power lines, because of downed trees. And so we had days when people could not actually uh, right. get, use the roads to get their families to, to, to school, to work, throughout Westchester County. So, you No, know, I, I completely understand and empathize with your concerns on this issue. I think you're right on track to be concerned about this. We ourselves are looking at this, and we will get you that information. So I, I definitely want to see updated reports because also the confluence of factors during Superstorm Sandy were very concerning. You know, we had swells up to, I think it was 10 feet. Mm -hmm. I think our clearance was 12 feet. It was something very close. Right. And, and it was very close. And so a storm with just a little more strength, a little more flooding, a little more rain would have perhaps overwhelmed the plant. Right. And, and we are, we're looking at that, too. And we we're only had a second generator, only one backup. So, again, if you just look at Fukushima as an example of all the things that can go wrong that you can't possibly imagine could go wrong, I was beginning to see it during Superstorm Sandy. If it was two more feet, right. if it flooded the, the second um, generator, if it – I mean – you can we, see we it are, happening, and then I saw all the trees down and the power lines down. There would be no evacuation avail availability. You're, you're, you're right to be concerned about these issues, um, and we are too. And we are taking our lessons from Fukushima and mm -hmm. from Superstorm Sandy and ensuring that there are flood hazard analyses being redone for Indian Point for right. other plants as well. Okay. So be assured that we're on top of this. When in terms of cybersecurity, yes, this is a threat that's constantly changing. I think we've been way ahead of the game on this one. We required regulations on cybersecurity for our licensees, nuclear power plant licensees, in 2009. Mm -hmm. And we're working on that. Uh, I ask Commissioner Ostendorf to say something more on that issue. He's an expert on that one. Okay. I'm not an expert, but I've had some experience in this from other jobs. I'll just tell you that uh, we agree with you, Senator, that cyber is a key area of concern. We've taken it very seriously. As the chairman noted, the NRC put out a rule in 2009 requiring our nuclear power plants to comply with certain cyber requirements. Uh, we meet as a commission frequently with the Department of Homeland Security, CERT group on critical infrastructure concerns, as well as the FBI, as well as the National Security Agency. And, uh, Look, for the sake of time, respecting the, the hearing, I would just tell you that in, in a, a couple of our meetings with DHS, the experts they have on industrial control systems for critical infrastructure, they've commented very favorably upon the regulations we have in place. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. And I hope the rest of you can answer her in writing because she's hit on something that also impacts my people. I remember, Senator, um, that I when I went to visit the San Onofre plant, which is now shut down, 
millions of people live within 50 miles, similar to your situation. And I asked the sheriff, I said, what happens in case of an emergency here at the plant? And she sort of laughed in a sad way and pointed to the freeway and said, that's our answer. And you know, just on a regular day, it, you're backed up. So it's, it's a huge issue because a lot of the time these plants are quite old. I don't know how old your plant is, must be quite old. And the population was much smaller. And then you discover these new earthquake faults or tsunami zones and with climate change, the different kinds of impacts. So I think you're on to something critical, which is the emergency preparedness just has to be more front and center given the fact that we're going into these extreme weather events that shock us. It's, thank you very much. So I'll say to the panel, the first vote has started. I'm going to stay here uh, as long as I can finish my questioning. If, uh, if anyone wants to come back, they should go vote now, come back. If not, we'll recess until we finish all five votes. And again, hang around here, but you can take at least a half hour in the second panel. So I'm going to ask my questions. Um, Madam Chairman, when you talked about your tenure, you said significant progress in post-Fukushima safety. And I guess that goes to the issue of beauty is in the eye of the beholder, because I look at the NRC's near-term task force, which was made up of senior staff who represented together 135 years of experience and made just 12 recommendations to address Fukushima lessons learned. Now, they did that in July 2011. They put out their 12 recommendations. I say to all commissioners, July 2012 passed, July 2013 passed, July 2014 passed, and there isn't one of these that's in place. Not a single one. And we have a chart, just in case, you know, I don't want you to say I don't agree with you, because you can't not agree. Because here's the facts. None of them are in place, period. So how you can say you're proud of what you did? I know you're, you did a lot of other things that are good, but how you can say you're proud that you helped us post Fukushima, that's beyond my ability to understand. And I guess we'd have to sit and talk for a long time for me to figure it out. Because I'm a person who believes there are benchmarks. You lay them out, and you meet them. Whether it's my world, if I have to visit so many counties by such and such a time, I commit to do it, I do it, or I fail. So here it is, and not one of them has been implemented by the industry. Um, at the same time, while this is going on, thank you so much. At the same time, the NRC has apparently joined with Russia to block a reactor safety proposal overseas that would require existing reactors to be retrofitted to prevent accidents caused by severe earthquakes or other natural hazards. So I, I don't know. Again, I'm sure you're proud of your work. I'm sure there's things you could point to, and I'm happy. But for me, sitting in a state that now has one plant left, and one plant closed because, in my opinion, there was lax oversight. Could have been the problem they faced could have been prevented. Be that as it may, why haven't these been done, and why did you join with this Russia idea we should move forward? You want to answer that? Sure. Let me, let me answer your question about... Uh, what I think you're talking about here, the proposal that you're referring to in terms of Russia, is the proposed amendment to the Convention on Nuclear Safety. Let me state up front that we work closely with our European counterparts. We collaborate with them a lot over Fukushima uh, changes that we're all doing. We've been collaborating extensively with them. And our view on the proposed amendment to the Convention on nu Nuclear Safety is that we're already meeting these, sa that safety, the essence of that amendment in other ways. And by opening up an amendment to the Convention on Nuclear Safety, it's a difficult, long, time-consuming process, and it may actually damage global nuclear safety. We are viewed Wait a minute. as a I have to. I have to ask you. It will damage nuclear safety to require existing reactors to be retrofitted to prevent accidents 
caused by severe earthquakes or other natural hazards. That is your quote. It would be damaging to safety. I don't understand you. I want to be clear about what I said. And what I said was that amending the Convention on Nuclear Safety is a very difficult, long-term, time-consuming okay. process. Okay, Opening I don't have a lot convention. of time. So just give me a yes or no. The Russia proposal opposes opposes that reactors be retrofitted to protect against natural hazards, and you oppose that. That's not what the Russian proposal that. proposes. The Russians are saying they do not want to amend the amendment right, to make language. It stronger, to make no, it stronger. They simply are saying they want do not want to amend the amendment language. We are in, in heavily involved in working with the State Department, who has the lead on the negotiations on this issue of okay. whether to amend you know what? the Convention I, I'm, on I, Nuclear I'm Safety. Not, I, since you're on your way out the door, and happily, I think, for you, because I think you're happy, and you're proud of what you did, and I'm glad that you're proud of what you did. I just have to say, you teamed up with Russia. That's the story to block a reactor safety proposal overseas that would require existing reactors to be retrofitted to prevent accidents caused by severe earthquakes. And that's just the fact, and it's disturbing to me, uh, that we're teaming up with Russia on this. It just is disturbing, given Russia's record. Given Russia's record. Now, I have a question I'm going to ask each of you to answer. Do you believe, and think this through, before you answer it. This is not a trick question. It's pretty straightforward. But I want you to think it through. Do you believe that reactor operators are required to comply with their operating licenses? Do you believe that reactor operators are required to comply with their operating licenses? Mr. Barron. Yes. Ms. Finicky. Uh, Yes, this is the license issued to each operator? Yes. yes. And yes, thank yes, you. Yes, it is. Yes, we require reactor operators okay. to comply with their licenses. Yes. 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 Excellent. So, despite your answers, the Commission has allowed California's Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant to continue to operate even though it is out of compliance with the seismic safety terms of its license. NRC also declined to act when its own senior inspector said that the plant should be shut down until it could be shown that it was in compliance with its license. Can you confirm that Diablo Canyon is operating without a license that accounts for the new seismic faults? And I ask that question, Mr. Barron. I think the answer is somewhat complicated because there was a very complicated licensing history for Diablo Canyon. So the, I think there are two questions. One's safety, one's compliance. On the safety side, the staff, the NRC staff has looked at it, done an independent review of the data, and they have concluded it's safe to operate the plant. The separate question, which is really more what you're getting at, is are they in compliance with their license? Yes, right now, the, the staff is looking at whether a license amendment would be necessary there. Okay. It is not in dispute that PG&E is out of compliance, compliance with its license. And that is why PG&E asked NRC for a license amendment and then it withdrew. So does anyone disagree with that? It is not in dispute that PG&E is out of compliance with its license. I think you're referring to the license amendment request that they withdrew with yes. regards to the seismic hazard Correct. analysis. And the reason they withdrew that is that we provided guidance when we required them after Fukushima to do a new seismic hazard reevaluation. So that's why they withdrew that license amendment request. So, Madam Chairman, can you confirm that Diablo Canyon is operating without a license that accounts for the new seismic faults since they, NRC never approved a new request? They are in compliance with their license, and we consider them safe to operate. <laughs> Until we see new information that tells us otherwise, 
And if we find new information that suggests that they are not safe to operate, we will shut them down. Of course, that is what we do with any nuclear Does power Does their plant. current license cover the new information discovered on the earthquake fault? Does their current license cover that? I, I think this is a very complex issue. You know, and when there people have been say years... Things, let me just give you my opinion. As someone who's been in politics a long time, I always tell my constituents, when someone says, this is complicated, you know, they really don't want to answer it. I am telling you, we have information, and you know that very well, of new seismic problems there. The license doesn't match that. They need to upgrade their facility. Your own senior inspector said it. Why don't you listen to your own senior inspector? Could you answer that question? Who says they ought to shut down? We did. Until, excuse me? We Who did. said that they ought to be shut down or make the upgrades? And you're saying you did listen to the license, to the inspector? Certainly, we have this. And what have I you done? Spoke to earlier. Make sure we sure they shut to down the, until they upgrade the facility. We considered the concerns of the senior resident inspector who himself said that there was no immediate safety concern that he was presenting. Well, immediate Canyon. is not good enough for this senator. And immediate is not good enough for the 500,000 people who live within 50 miles. Immediate, that's what they said at Fukushima. Oh, there's no immediate problem, and Fukushima happened. This is a problem. You know there's a problem there. I'm going to go into this with the second panel. I'm going to move along. The NRC Inspector General recently issued its report about how NRC oversaw efforts by the operator of the California San Onofre nuclear power plant to replace its steam generators using a less rigorous regulatory process. The flawed steam generators ultimately caused the plant's permanent closure. The NRC Inspector General said the NRC missed an opportunity to identify the problems with the steam generators when it inspected San Onofre's steam generator replacement efforts in 2009 with NRC experts saying that there were many shortcomings in the analysis Southern California Edison provided to the NRC to justify the less rigorous regulatory process. Do any of you disagree with the conclusion of the Inspector General of the NRC? Anybody disagree with that? Senator, we actually have a lessons learned analysis going on for the San Onofre, San Onofre nuclear power plant. And part of that analysis will look at what we call the 10 CFR Let me try this again. process. Let me try this again. The NRC Inspector General said that two former senior NRC officials said that Calif Southern Cal Edison should have applied for a license amendment for its new steam generators, which would have required a much more rigorous review by the NRC. And let me add parenthetically, and maybe that plant wouldn't have had to shut down. They also said the NRC would not have approved such a license amendment because the design was fatally flawed. Do any of you disagree with the IG's conclusion that NRC should have done a more rigorous review? We are in the process of looking at their conclusions. You don't conclusions. know if you agree? We are in the process of looking at their conclusions in terms of the situation at the San Onofre power plant. Okay, could I just say, it is so frustrating. You have senior officials that talk about safety, you have an IG that faults you, and oh, all you're doing is continuing to look at something. You've got 12 recommendations that are very clear and even most people could understand what they are. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Not one has been done, and you say you're proud of the work of the commission. Not one is in place. Not one. The up, no upgrade to the emergency response training. No longer-term study of emergency response topics. No improved reactor inspection and oversight. It's unbelievable. There's not a study completed to upgrade the seismic flooding and other hazard protections. Some licenses are still not in compliance with pre-Fukushima requirements. So all I'm saying is, think what you will about 
how great a job you're all doing, and I know you work hard. Every one of you cares deeply. But you've got to do better because this isn't an academic setting where we talk about things that may happen. I live in a real world where I go out to these places and I look in the eyes of the people, who some of, which, of whom are going to be here this afternoon. And when Senator Gillibrand says, after Superstorm Sandy, she was terrified at what could happen at that point. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying from the bottom of my heart, more has to be done. And I, and I want to address the new commissioners who are joining a team here. I hope you four can work as a team. And I hope you can find common ground. And if you can't agree on doing the 12 things, for God's sakes, do the two things or the three things or the four things. Get it done. Because one of those 12 things could be absolutely critical. So I, I'm kind of, I, I guess I want to ask another question of, of Chairman Farland. Or at all of you. This is another question. So think it through before you answer. Do any of you disagree that when reactor operators replace equipment like steam generators, NRC's so-called 50.59 regulations require the operators to demonstrate that the new equipment can perform safely? Do any of you disagree with that? No, but... Well, not Madam but. Chairman, if, if, you, if, you, if you would, I would like to submit for the record our charts sure. that show we'll progress on. that we've made yeah. on Fukushima upgrades oh, sure. at plants. Sure. Okay? And then what I want is for you to tell me, and I will give to you the list of 12, and you tell me which one of those. Absolutely. We are place. happy to but, provide all so, of that information. So let me get back to my questioning. Let the record reflect that none of you disagree. The operator has to demonstrate the new equipment can perform safely when there's replaced equipment like steam generators. Now, I'd like to place NRC's response to questions my staff asked about Diablo Canyon into the record. Those responses acknowledge that when PG&E replaced both its steam generators and its reactor vessel head, it did not comply with NRC's 5059 regulations. What's more, the analysis PG&E failed to do was to answer the question of whether the new equipment could work safely following both a severe earthquake and a loss of ability to cool the reactors, similar to what happened in Fukushima. So I'd like Chairman McFarland to answer this. Can you confirm that NRC has known about PG&E's failure to meet these key NRC regulations, the 5059, since 2011, but has not taken enforcement action against the licensee for this failure? Uh, Madam Chairman, I did learn recently about this issue, and uh, I am aware of the general outlines of this issue. I asked the staff to get back to me on this issue, and they informed me that the licensee in 2011 found that this, the PG&E noted the failure to uh, do this kind of information, collect this kind of information, and uh, they, in the, it also at that time, they did the the evaluation that they needed to have done previously, and the NRC concurred on that. I'll put in the record the fact that the NRC did not pursue this issue, and uh, we have the background on it. They have known about it, you have known about it since 2011. I got the proof from the staff, your staff, and did nothing about it. I'm going to turn it over to Senator Markey, give him the gavel. I'll run and vote and come right back, and then you can vote on the second vote. Is that okay, Senator? I'll be right back.